Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on um, on where you're watching us. Um, so um, I'm very very happy to um, wel welcome first to this uh, to this session, uh, which is hosted uh, in the context of the first edition of the of the Delos uh, Gap uh, Symposium. For those who do not know what Gap means, uh, it's the Delos Guide to Arbitration uh, Places, which is uh, an, an editorial project uh, which is uh, designed to help corporate counsel easily determine, determine and assess the risks uh, uh, that they're taking and, and, and the, the expectation that they should have when they uh, insert um, an arbitration agreement uh, in their contract. Um, and um, uh, Hafez, uh, Virgi and I are the, the general editors of this this project and this is in this capacity that I'm opening the, 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 this, uh, this session uh, today. Um, and uh, for, 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 this, um, uh, for this session uh, today, which is a, a fireside question time uh, with Gar and the Kluwer Arbitration blog, everything that you've ever wanted to know, I'm sure uh, thanks to uh, Sarah's question, Alison and Krina will will tell us a lot about things that we've always dreamt of asking. Um, our three panelists uh, today certainly do not need an introduction to all the arbitration practitioners that are, that are watching, but nevertheless, uh, I do want to, to, to introduce you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm personally very happy to see, to see uh, you three uh, again. Um, so starting with uh, Sarah, who will uh, moderate uh, the session, uh, Sarah Aranjo, um, uh, he is uh, both a civil law and a common law trained lawyer uh, based uh, in the, the, the Dubai office of, of Al Tamimi and, and company. Um, I'm sure you all know Al Tamimi, but it's, it's the largest law firm in the, in the Middle East. And she, she, Sarah, regularly advises and, and represents clients uh, in arbitration proceedings, but, but not only that, also in arbitration related court proceedings which means that Sarah is able to handle uh, a dispute from the beginning, from the request of the arbitration, to uh, uh, the, the, the very important aspect of recovering the, the money. Um, and she's also an adjunct professor of law at the University of Paris II, Panthéon Assas, a very prestigious French university, and a member of several professional organizations. Um, she's uh, among, among, among many others. I'm not going to list them all uh, today, but she she's, uh, uh, has, has been appointed as a member of um, uh, the, the ICC Commission on, on Arbitration, ADR, um, Task Force on Arbitration, uh, and ADR, uh, on the, the IBA Subcommittee on International Arbitration Case Law, and the, the uh, DIFC's uh, Courts Arbitration uh, Division Working Group. Um, and she's uh, Tellingly, uh, has been uh, designated as as uh, uh, the Middle East Rising uh, Star Lawyer of uh, the of the year 2019 uh, by the Association of Corporate Counsel. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Krina Baltag uh, uh, is a senior lecturer in international arbitration at uh, Stockholm University. She's qualified uh, as she practices in, as an attorney as well. Uh, so has both an academic and practical background um, and uh, with, with considerable practice in, in international dispute resolution. Um, uh, she has been appointed in numerous um, uh, arbitrations uh, as sole arbitrator and co-arbitrator under the ICC, the LCA and the, the, the SIAC rules. I have no doubt that this will also be the case uh, under the DELOS rules uh, uh, soon enough. Um, and um, and um, she's, she's a, a member of the, the board of the, the SCC, the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce Arbitration Institute, uh, and of course, the editor of the very famous Kluver Arbitration blog, which is one of my daily readings. And the other daily reading is of course, the Global Arbitration Review. Uh, we have today, we're very uh, lucky to have Alison Ross, um, uh, who um, uh, graduated with a first class degree from, from Christ Church, Oxford, and then start, interestingly, started as a, uh, as a practicing as a lawyer uh, in London, uh, before then realizes that uh, her, her 
uh, uh, vocation would be uh, to be a journalist. Uh, and since then, uh, she's joined uh, very, very uh, shortly after the creation of the Global Arbitration Review, one of the, the first uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, feed us with uh, very interesting and well-researched articles uh, concerning uh, ongoing arbitration cases, um, arbitration enforcement proceedings, uh, and many other aspects. Uh, and I believe, Alison, you've traveled the world uh, doing this Singapore, Rio and Janeiro, Mauritius, uh, as opposed to uh, staying before uh, the English courts. Um, so you've, you've been Gaz uh, editor since 2010, and, uh, and uh, you continue to write uh, for the publication and uh, 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 editing your, your work. I am very, very happy to, uh, uh, to have introduced this session. Um, and now I will leave the floor to Sarah for a fireside question session with Alison and Krina. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for this very kind of introduction. And uh, many thanks to the loss uh, for the invitation and, and well done on this first inaugural edition albeit virtual of the GAP Symposium. I'm very delighted to be with you all here and uh, particularly happy to share the discussion today with both um, Alison and, and Krina. And um, as, as you've pointed out, uh, the purpose of this discussion today is to try as much as possible, give the participants an overview as to what happens a little bit in the background. Uh, we, we all are um, seasoned practitioners, and we know the impact that Kluwer and Gar have so far had on the practice as a whole. And I myself do personally await every day at 1 a.m. Dubai time the Gar alerts uh, be before um, I had I, I had um, to, to bet. So uh, I, I think Gar and Kluwer have pretty much punctuated more or less the manner in which also we conduct arbitrations. Now this is. Um, uh, th this is a chat that hopefully will last for about 50 minutes or so, and we'll try as much as possible to the extent there are questions from the participants to take some of them. Now, just to uh, maybe by way of a background to everyone, I would uh, maybe start off with um, what, what you just said, Thomas, is that uh, Alison joined GAR uh, back in 2007, when it was more or less of a startup publication. And we've seen the exponential and impressive growth uh, that GAR has managed to sort of metamorphose itself and the way it managed to establish itself today as one of the definitely leading publications in the world of international arbitration. So, so maybe a question that's also of a personal interest to me to Alison is, is sort of how did it all started? We, we, we've seen, you know, you, you've had a an impressive academic background, you joined the startup. So it would be very helpful if you could share with us a little bit, you know, the, the origins, how it sort of all started and the rationale behind it. Um, well, the publishing house, LBR, already had two publications when I joined, which were um, a competition publication, competition law, and Latin Lawyer, um, which dealt with Latin American. Um, law developments. And I believe it was Bill Rowley, who was who is now the chair of our editorial board, who floated the idea of an arbitration publication um, in a conversation with David Samuels, our publisher. Um, to an extent, Gar grew out of Latin Lawyer, because at the time, there were a huge number of investor state cases against Argentina concerning its response to the financial crisis. So those were being written up for the Latin American publication, and it was a kind of natural step forward to have a devoted arbitration publication as we started to get to know the world and started to, to understand how arbitration worked. Um, and yeah, I originally worked both on Latin Lawyer and GAR. It started off as a two days a week publication and um, very shortly afterwards became a daily publication. Yeah. That's uh, the and maybe 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 uh, uh, 
the same question to, to Karina is um, in your capacity as the editor of the Clure Arbitration blog, can you take us you know, back in time as to how things initially started off? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I appreciate the invitation uh, on behalf of Clover Arbitration Blog, and thank you, Sarah, for moderating this. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. And needless to say, it's a pleasure to be sitting here with uh, Alison, and uh, we have a great collaboration going back a long time. Um, Global, uh, uh, Global Arbitration Review obviously is a bit different than Club Arbitration Blog, but ultimately I think uh, uh, we, we uh, grew up or we evolved uh, together with the arbitration industry and, and the need came uh, sort of naturally. Uh, the first post on Club Arbitration Blog uh, was in January 2009. So we have about 12 years. Uh, and uh, I joined the blog in 2012, um, so also kind of right at the beginning. And uh, it's interesting, the story, because um, um, Kluver had this idea to, to have a blog and basically to uh, offer a more interactive publication, which would have made the Kluver publications a bit more complete in terms of the offering. And um, at the same time, this idea was floating within the ITA, the Institute for Transnational Arbitration, and in particular, Professor Roger Alford, he had this idea of an arbitration blog. And um, it all started, the desire was to have uh, this uh, form of discussions uh, of high quality. Um, at that time, in 2009, 2010, um, the blog relied quite a lot on the permanent contributors, the permanent bloggers, let's put it this way. Uh, some of them are still with the blog nowadays, but um, uh, it also had the idea of offering a platform to new and diverse voices. And, and this, is, this, this is a clear uh, goal that we follow today as well. And we try to mirror the arbitration community. And now it's the interesting story is that with, uh, with, our, with the arbitration blogs, Kluver started developing other blogs which are equally successful. And one that is very close to the arbitration blog is the mediation blog. So we have a, we have a good sister uh, uh, with us. Uh, and of course, continuing the story. That's, um, that, that's um, I mean, my, when you look at it now, uh, both publications, I, I think, you know, um, you, you've pretty much done, come a long way. And, and I think, as I've mentioned earlier, the growth has been quite both exponential and impressive. So now fast forwarding a little bit to, to where we currently are, you know, in current times, I appreciate the pandemic. And this is something we're going to touch upon a little bit later in our discussion. But uh, Alison, how, how do things stand now? I mean, if, if you were maybe very briefly to discuss almost 13 years later, comparing the time when you joined, how the setup was initially done and currently how sort of you would sort of describe that, that impressive transformation. How, how would you sort of put it down? Um, well, now, I mean, GAR has a massive readership all over the world, and we've always got a huge backlog of stories to report. We have, you know, people queuing up to be featured, to have their conferences reported. Um, we've also branched out a lot ourselves. Originally, it was just um, a news service. Now we've branched out into conferences ourselves. We have the GAR Lives conferences, which are currently GAR Interactives because they're virtual. Um, we have the GAR Awards, which take place annually in Paris. Um, and we have all kinds of indexes and surveys that we produce, sometimes in collaboration with other arbitration bodies like um, the Chartered Institute. Um, and we've got a database of arbitrators called GAR Art, all of which are available on our website, um, if you can find them. Um, I think the major difference really is how accepted um, we have become. When I started out in 2007, we were viewed with immense suspicion. And I think a lot of people were horrified at the idea of a publication dedicated to this 
highly confidential and secretive area. Um, but now we're, we're welcomed with open arms at conferences. We almost feel like we are part of the community ourselves, embedded within the community, um, sometimes rather too much so for comfort. So I think that, that has been the kind of major leap forward since we first started out. Yeah. I mean, definitely, uh, I mean, we will be touching upon this. You are definitely potentially the fourth power in arbitration if we were to make a, a, an, an analogy with the pillars of democracy, which are three and media being the fourth. I'm not sure to which extent we can make such an analogy, but um, <laughs> I think Gar currently definitely along with Kluwer and other um, uh, arbitration related media definitely have um, a, 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 a weighing effect. So, so uh, Karina, can you also please share with us sort of the process of development? If we were to fast forward between that first article that you mentioned post on the blog back in 2009, January 2009, and today almost you know, 12 years later, how, how would have things sort of uh, evolved? Well, I think, I think the most important thing uh, and what makes us uh, a successful uh, one of the elements is our team. And uh, I wanted to start with this because I think this is, uh, this is very important. So we started with, a, with, a, with, a, with an editor, uh, Professor Roger Alford, and two uh, assistant editors, myself and Annalise Nelson, who is now at the US State Department. Uh, and we evolved into something that it's, uh, it's we call it a, a machinery. <laughs> it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, and to some extent, uh, we are approached almost every day uh, by, by practitioners, young practitioners who would like to be part of the team. We have uh, uh, Professor Alfred continues to be the general editor. I'm the editor, the managing editor. We have uh, three associate editors Kieran Gore from George Washington University, Benson Lee from Hagen Lovell, Singapore, S. Mesterlo from uh, Australian National University, uh, excellent people. And we have 23 assistant editors from Australia to the United States. And these are bright, amazing people that helps, they, they, they help us reviewing the posts uh, and delivering uh, what we deliver on a daily basis. And I think this is another important element from one, two posts per week. We're now delivering one, at least one uh, per day. Um, I think the regional coverage is tremendous now. We, um, we managed to cover regional developments and arbitration uh, from everywhere in the world. And this is, this is thanks to the amazing team that we have. Um, we started developing coverage of topics. Uh, for instance, we had for the uh, uh, expedited arbitration rules the week right before the rules of trial working with group two. Um, we have, we started to include a lot of media in our posts. Uh, we have audio in the video snippets in our latest posts. We have um, overwhelming number of submissions that we receive every month. Uh, and um, of course we have an excellent partnership with our permanent contributors, which nowadays are also arbitration institutions. Um, and the latest product, which is a Clover product, but involves a lot, the arbitration blog is International Law Talk, which is a series, series of podcasts uh, with arbitration practitioners. And we had this uh, week, the launch of the product with the interview with Professor Bernard Hanotio. So um, as you can hear is uh, from that one post <laughs> where probably what GAR is today uh, is just we evolved massively. That's, uh, that's, that's I think, uh, I, 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 what I think is, is a pretty good of a success story uh, for, for both publications. And, and so I, I think pretty much how we can sum it up is um, currently, and you've both touched upon it, you're pretty much today a victim of your own success in a sense that um, I, I think um, you are both receiving, and Alison pointed out today, I'm sure you receive tons of requests of people and individuals and organizations wanting to be featured 
and, and likewise, Karina, for the Clear Arbitration blog, I'm sure many contributors. So, so, so what I would be interested maybe to um, hear from you, maybe a sneak peek as to how do you sort of do the selection process? Because I'm sure at some point there are certain considerations of you know, accuracy or quality of the product or the work product that's gonna be ultimately published out there and that's gonna embed the Kluwer blog or the GAR stamp. So um, maybe Alison, you could maybe start off by telling us how do you try and balance it out, you know, different considerations. And, and, and is it a matter of, I mean, obviously quality could be, could be one factor, but how do you try to manage uh, what 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 you've became, you know, you, you've pretty much became a victim of your own success. So how do you sort of face that large demand? Um, yeah, I I mean I think owing to our success, um, we're in a lucky position where when it comes to selection of stories, we have we have a lot of help. We have the readers doing a lot of the work for us, kind of pointing to significant decisions, suggesting interesting themes we could explore. Um, there is, you know, there are times when we have to be more investigative and the, the GAR day begins every day with a massive Google search and trawling through websites looking for, you know, probably a very badly written foreign news report which hints at an arbitration award and then because we know the market we know how to follow that up and who to ask and, you know, where to look for details. Um, in terms of kind of balancing considerations, unlike Clua, we're a daily publication. So we have the impetus to be first with the news. Um, and there is always, um, we always have to kind of weigh the consideration of speed versus how much detail we're going to include. We won't compromise on accuracy. Um, we have to be accurate, but we can compromise on detail. So sometimes we know the outcome of an award um, and we can report just the outcome with a bit of comment from a lawyer, but without actually seeing the award itself and analyzing the legal reasoning. And then we have to decide whether to do a follow-up story later on. Um, so that's one of the considerations we have to weigh. Um, but yes, um, yeah, I mean, so 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 definitely, I think you have these. I, I, I would say important factors, uh, uh, which sort of operate by way of a filter, or by way of an initial filter as to you know what, what goes ultimately out and and uh, to the to I would say to the world potentially, um, and 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 Karina, uh, 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 it would be helpful to hear sort of how you also ad adopt and how do you adjust to that increasing high level of demand. I mean, you've, you've alluded to the Kluwer mediation blog as well. And I, I know that, you know, uh, Kluwer now is doing that extra effort of trying, you know, thematically the, the, the devising the topics, but how do you sort of try to do that selection part? I mean, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, ultimately you're more or less of a public forum where you have an open ended invitation to whoever wants to contribute, but it would be quite interesting to hear how you sort of operate that selection process. Yes, so we are, we are, as I said, we are open to everybody. And I think this is, uh, this is uh, an important feature of, of, of the blog. We receive contributions, uh, but we have, a, we have a very strict review process. So just to, just to give you an idea, uh, we have at least two layers of review. So once, once the post is received, we have to make sure that the topic fits within the blog, uh, obviously arbitration. Uh, it can be international, it can be domestic, um, commercial investment. Uh, um, after it's, it's uh, received, then it goes in this, in this review process. And we have to make sure that we don't compromise on originality. We don't compromise on quality, respect for the arbitration community and for arbitration, and we don't compromise on neutrality. Um, so we do, we do have a, a rigorous process. Uh, we tend to be fast because we are, a, we are a blog, 
uh, we are not a journal. Uh, we tend to say that we're, we're semi-academic in what we deliver. Um, so we can undertake the review in about two weeks uh, and we look at 1,500 uh, words uh, posts. Um, of course, we need to, as well uh, as GAR, we need to, we strive to be the first addressing the topic, but unlike GAR, we need to have those details. So for us, it's important, uh, we are not reporting on a development, we're uh, addressing, we're discussing it, we're raising issues, uh, uh, we try to encourage uh, the arbitration community to participate in the discussion as well. And uh, most of the times we, we are successful in being first uh, um, and, uh, and uh, in delivering this, this type of, of, uh, of contribution. I think it's also important that um, for, for us, at least as, at the blog, uh, because we are open to everybody, um, it's important that certain um, uh, guidelines are followed. So we have our editorial guidelines and policies. And this is because we don't want to be turned into a revenge uh, uh, outlet or uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an outlet preparing a case for, for a, a, a practitioner and so on. So we are trying and we try to address these concerns uh, and make sure that what we deliver is quality posts to the community. Thank you, thank you to both of you. Um, I, I think one important, um, maybe, um, uh, again, I think it's also a, a question of personal interest and I'm sure many of our participants today would also be keen on finding out more about this as well. But, but to the extent, and you've both touched upon it, there are competing considerations. And Alison, you mentioned, for example, there could be competing considerations with trying to get the story out first but also at the same time balancing potentially that you know you're getting the right story with the right facts out in and you know gar being a daily publication i would say there is a heightened pressure of balancing both considerations so on one hand you don't compromise quality and you don't compromise your own credibility as a as a serious publication but on the other of also not i would say burn the story out or have you know the risk of having another publication, um, get it out first. So I would assume that there are undoubtedly as well certain challenges for you as part of your reporting to be able to sort of balance out these factors. And so it would be interesting because you, you've mentioned it as well. You know, I, I think one of the main features as well of, of arbitration is the confidentiality element to it, which is still quite prevailing, notwithstanding the, 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 the push for more transparency into the arbitration world. But nevertheless, uh, confidentiality uh, still remains a, re a prevailing factor. And arbitration is still, by default, a confidential process. So I, I, I would be particularly interested to hear about the, the sort of reporting methodologies you used and, and obviously challenges that I'm, I'm sure you, you, you'd face in trying to get a grip on, on, on a story and then fact checking it and making sure the resources and the source reporting it is accurate. Um, well, in relation to confidentiality, we often get asked this question and we often meet a certain amount of incredulity that we have a daily publication on a field that is supposedly confidential. All I can really say is it, it isn't as much of a problem as it might appear because there does come a point in most cases when um, commercial arbitration decisions do enter the public domain, normally at the enforcement stage, when a court decision is issued that either references the decision in some detail or sometimes attaches it. Um, and so that is the point when we leap um, and the details of this confidential commercial arbitration emerge into the light. Um, obviously the field of investment arbitration is a bit different. It's increasingly public because of the public interest at stake. Um, and so, there is a move in that area towards much greater transparency anyway, and we have no problem whatsoever getting details of investment arbitration decisions. 
Um, it still can be an issue for us in the sense that it is sometimes wielded by lawyers as an obstruction to us reporting a story. Um, often when those lawyers don't come out of the case so favorably, they don't want it reported. Um, so they raise the issue of confidentiality, but in reality, it, it isn't that much of a, a problem because of details entering the public domain, at which point they lose their confidentiality. Um, you asked me about other challenges. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges GAR actually faces is the rather strange situation that we're in, where our readership is also our subject matter. So people are essentially paying subscriptions to read about themselves and their own cases. And that is all perfectly fine when we're publishing complimentary articles about lawyers getting promoted. But there also come moments when, for example, a lawyer or a firm is criticized by a tribunal because of unethical behavior or other conduct. And obviously we have an obligation to report that, but it can put us in a very uncomfortable situation when we are personally acquainted with that lawyer, we may have worked with him on conferences. Um, and I do worry about how embedded GAR has become in the arbitration community and how we can marry that with kind of keeping our distance and objectivity when it comes to reporting the more unpleasant stories. There is a bit of a tension between being part of this world and also being an objective commentator upon it. That's um, that's quite interesting, you know, that, that mirror image which you just gave, which is, you know, on one hand, you're reporting on individuals which are could end up and often do end up potentially subject matter of your own um, articles. And, and, and um, I mean, you know, especially what I think of is when you report on cases where, you know, counsel uh, obviously, there is always a winner and a loser in an arbitration case, at least often. And so one point I can think of is to which extent maybe counsel could be less cooperative or refuses or refrains from commenting in circumstances where, you know, the outcome hasn't necessarily been quite favorable. So how often would that sort of play in and how do you sort of try and deal with it? Yeah, I mean, that quite often happens. We, we do get lawyers who are obviously trying to block a story because it's not favorable to them or to their client yes. and um, because of the time pressure we're under it's very easy for them to say oh well either to raise the confidentiality card or to um, suggest to us that that the story isn't accurate which obviously gives us pause for thought I mean, I think one thing that GAR does that has helped to build up trust in the community over the years is, especially in stories about contentious matters, we often give both sides a draft of the story before it is published and an opportunity to comment on it. Um, so that does help us in this situation because if we provide them with a draft, they say it's not accurate, then we say, well, tell us how to make it accurate. Um, <laughs> If they won't do that, it, it's apparent that they're being obstructive rather than um, rather than being actually concerned for the accuracy of the story. Um, but yes, I mean, lawyers, the lawyers we work with, I mean, obviously, they're very litigious people. They have their clients interests at stake. And that can be quite difficult for, for junior journalists on GAR who have to um, who have to deal with them. Um, often they're lovely and extremely helpful, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes we cross them and it, it can be tricky. That's interesting. And, and, and Karina, I mean, I, I know that the type of, um, you know, predominantly the CLUR arbitration block ten, tends to publish a, a different type of, 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 of content, uh, but um, I would also be keen on knowing, uh, you know, potential um, challenges also you face, particularly maybe what, well, what first comes to mind is certain maybe specific topics or subtopics, which might not necessarily be well covered or potentially topics which have been overly covered and then additional uh, uh, readers wanting to publish further on it. So the topic is not necessarily novel or innovative, academically speaking. 
And obviously I think one point as well is the geographic coverage, because obviously with the growth of international arbitration over the past two, three decades, um, I, I think arbitration has literally managed to establish itself as a truly international practice area of the law. And so in, in, indeed, um, it, I would be quite keen on hearing from you sort of those, not necessarily reporting, because that's not necessarily accurate in light of, of what, what the Kluwer arbitration blog has positioned itself for, but sort of what challenges have you, have, have you faced in view of trying to diversify both substance, but also geography? I was, uh, I was going to say that in a way, I think we're quite fortunate that we don't have Alison's problems, but we do have uh, close to the, what, uh, what she mentioned. Uh, we've seen cases, and uh, as I mentioned, where uh, uh, perhaps uh, some authors try to prepare a case in advance. And, and uh, we, 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 we learned about that and we had to take some measures because obviously it's, it's, it's one thing to debate the topic and the other thing is to, to create uh, or, or to manufacture uh, uh, legal exhibits for your case. So uh, with, with this, I think uh, that's correct. And that's a correct uh, description, Sarah. Um, we, we present, we debate uh, topics in arbitration in a neutral manner. And I think this is, this, this is very important for us as a blog and for what we try to present to the readers. Um, we, 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 we started building um, uh, the, the, the arbitration knowledge on the, on, the, on the blog by expanding our team. And we realized that if we are going to receive or if we are trying to represent what the arbitration community is and its interests and, and the topics, then we need to have those practitioners or, or specialized in that specific region or specific field. So our idea is if we're going to offer quality and we're going to receive and encourage posts uh, that are quite specific, then we need to have those people with us in our team that will understand the specificity of that region or the topic. So this is why we have uh, uh, so many editors on the blog because we try to cover all these aspects, and it's very important because they also do a, 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 they also take a proactive position. That is, they are always up to date with the developments in arbitration in a, in a specific region, in a country, or in a specific area, uh, and they also receive this uh, this proposals of of, uh, of drafts from our authors. Um, and I think the way to, to, as I said, because there is a review process, they make sure that the information that is put forward is accurate. The information, the discussion is a proper one from, uh, as I said, semi-academic point of view. Uh, it is original and uh, above all is with respect to the fellow colleagues in the arbitration community. Uh, so we do not name and shame on the blog. Uh, if there is a critical point, a critical issue, and we have this, and obviously uh, uh, we need to address them, um, we encourage uh, the authors to do it in a neutral manner. Now, as to the topic, because obviously uh, uh, there are that many new topics in arbitration, uh, we do encourage everybody to, um, to take a look at the posts previously published on the topic and see if they can come up with a new approach. Uh, this being said, we welcome as many contributions as we can on specific topics. For example, obviously we had on COVID-19 uh, uh, and, and, and the, the angles to approach this are, are uh, still developing and we're still encouraging new approaches. Um, if, there is a, if there is an interesting case uh, for example, Anka versus Chubb, where we had numerous posts, uh, we welcome those contributions as well. Ultimately, we know that we are the first stop uh, uh, in arbitration for, for this type of, uh, of uh, references. And we know that we are the first stop, but whoever comes, whoever wants to be, to take a deep dive into arbitration, then will go from the blog to Kluver arbitration to the database or to other databases to books and so on. So with us, it's important that they find 
the relevant information and they can get the references to push their research. Uh, probably not everybody's reading uh, daily our posts and probably not all of them are interesting, but I know that it comes a time when they will need one of the posts that are published on the blog. And I think this is what is important and this is why we want to be as diverse as possible in the topics that we cover and in the regions that we cover. And, and indeed, I, I mean, I can definitely see over the past five years, myself at least, the additional heightened effort on diversifying as well the geographical coverage. Um, this is something very notable and noteworthy on GAR, for example, where I could see a very broad ge a geographical scope of, of the reporting being done, which, which is great. And, and obviously, Kluwer um, has been you know, di diversifying as well. And I think that's you know, a testament to the international nature of, of the practice. Um, a, a question which, which uh, you know, um, Alison, you've touched upon potentially, you know, what could be ultimately, I mean, allegations of potential unethical conduct, et cetera. So, so my question is, to which extent, you know, we, we, we're all aware of the power of media. And, and, and early on in the talk, I've made the analogy with media being sort of the fourth pillar of the democratic system. And, and so potentially, media could, could be also uh, obviously a pillar of, of, of a good and properly orderly conduct of arbitration. And we've seen certain stories out there uh, in which certain conducts or, um, uh, were reported. And obviously, to me, this was part of the push for more transparency on one hand, and we've seen many international arbitration institutions and organizations pushing for this. But ultimately, this all flows in to an output, which is we're all concerned to have a better uh, operation and framework of conduct of arbitration proceedings, because ultimately, the purpose of arbitration is to serve justice. And this is a very noble sort of. Um, so to which extent, um, in your view, has arbitration media and particularly GAR, if, if I may, shaped the practice of international arbitration, including, for example, providing for a push for more transparency or a drive towards more competent um, or ethical behaviors on part of arbitrators or even potentially counsel? Um. I certainly like to think that by providing scrutiny of the field, we have contributed to more ethical practice generally. Obviously, nobody wants to be the subject of negative coverage in GAR. Um, so hopefully that encourages them to behave appropriately. Um, I also think it's um, GAR has probably contributed to the kind of leveling of standards worldwide it's almost become like a soft law instrument in the way it describes, you know, tribunals, typical approaches um, and kind of sheds light on institutional practices. And I think that's probably contributed to standardization of the field, if, um, if that's a good thing. Obviously that's a matter of debate because some people think arbitration should be as bespoke as possible. Um, and yes, I think we have driven transparency um, by providing a platform that practitioners largely trust not to misreport the facts. I do think we still find that in mainstream media, arbitration is very misunderstood and very misreported. Um, whereas GAR provides a platform um, with journalists who understand how it all operates. Um, and I certainly think now um, practitioners and institutions have the expectation that they are going to be covered by GAR, which makes them more transparent upfront. Um, I, I think there's a kind of view that it's better to put the story out there and be in control of the story rather than have the story catch up with you. Um, um, so, 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 Karina, I mean, to, to, to the extent that um, 
you're not necessarily in, 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 in a daily reporting from the same perspective, but you're more on a semi-academic. But, but can I ask you also the same question? Because obviously I do think that you're definitely part of the, Kluwer is definitely part of the debate. And definitely when someone is part of the debate, it's definitely contributing to shaping as well better practices. So in your view, to which extent have you, um, ha have, has uh, Kluwer uh, contributed to shaping uh, positively or even negatively the practice of international arbitration? I think, uh, uh, and, and, and we can see this obviously in the, in the statistics that we have from the blog and, and how the readership grew from uh, 1,000 people to almost 200,000 people in, in the span of 10 years. And if you look at the geographical distribution, it's absolutely amazing that you, are re you, you have readers in Papua New Guinea and, and so on. So I think the, the, we, we are proud to think that we, we contribute to raising awareness about arbitration and how arbitration can be used in a positive way, but also we help identify the key issues uh, where we need to work on and we need to have further debate. Um, if one takes a look at the blog, uh, I was mentioning earlier, we had a series addressing specific topics. Um, so we grouped about five, six posts focusing on a specific topic. I mentioned the expedited arbitration, which is now before the UCI trial working group two. Uh, we also had a series addressing the energy charter treaty modernization process, which is something a bit non-transparent. So we try to make it more transparent on the blog um, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I think that's probably where, where I think we're strong. Now, of course, Kluver Arbitration Blog is part of Kluver uh, as, as, a, as a publishing house, as a publisher, and Kluver Arbitration as a database is, is uh, for many years the leading uh, resource for arbitration with the strongest pro probably uh, uh, in, in terms of publications on arbitration books and so on. And, uh, and Kluver is, is diversifying its portfolio to address these concerns with transparency, uh, raising awareness. So Kluver now has practical insights, also the collaboration with Arbitrator Intelligence uh, and uh, uh, developing other synergies in the field. For example, with Oxford University Press now to feature their products in the, in the database. So I think we're, we are all into the same uh, enterprise of making sure that arbitration is growing and is growing in a, in a proper manner. And when there are concerns, we, we are able to address them. And also we're able to give the floor to the new generation of arbitration practitioners. That's, that's, that's quite interesting. And, and you've touched um, a, 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 a upon you know, accessibility, Karina. And I think you know, it, it definitely, given the current times which are quite unprecedented that we're living in with the COVID-19 pandemic. But I, I would be very keen on knowing how sort of the, the pandemic has impacted maybe to the better or for worse, the manner in which you operate both respectively. And I'm talking about potentially the reporting, the publishing, or even the need has consumer users need, um, you know, been on the hike. We've all noticed that, you know, as a result of the pandemic as well, contentious activity has been on the spike as well. But maybe Alison, I'll, I'll be very grateful to hear from you as to how sort of uh, you live the pandemic, uh, I mean, uh, from GAR. How has GAR, you know, been living through the pandemic and what impact had, had the pandemic had on, on the way you operate? Um, I mean, GAR obviously has a huge events team, um, and obviously it, it's been impacted, as you know, all events teams have all over the world. Um, editorially speaking, I think um, GAR has become more important than ever, um, in the sense that there are so many people now working at home, kind of isolated from their colleagues, they can no longer walk into a colleague's room to get the latest gossip or to you know discuss the impact of a particular award or decision 
Um, so I think as a hub, we've we've become more important. You know, people are looking to us increasingly for information and for analysis that they can't get from a conversation by the photocopier anymore. Um, it's also provided us with a whole new rich seam of stories, both, you know, disputes that have arisen as a result of COVID-19 and kind of interruptions and in supply chains. Um, also, you know, endless analysis of what this will mean for the future of arbitration. You know, will arbitration be conducted differently in the future? Will we return to live hearings or will the virtual approach become more standard? Um, and that's all, you know, very interesting and very important. That's, uh, that's quite uh, telling. And, and, and Karina, how, how, how has sort of COVID impacted? I mean, you've been operating, uh, I, I would say, pretty much in a virtual format for a long time, but has COVID had any impact on, 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 on the manner in which Kluwer has operated? Has there been any increase potentially, you know, not, now that what Alison mentioned, people are pretty much stuck at home. So I would imagine there are pretty much a lot of innovative and flourishing ideas for publications. So how, how has COVID impacted you? That's, that's a great way to put it, sir. I think <laughs> uh, obviously we, we operate <laughs> and Kluver in general, obviously there, there are hard, hard copy publications from Kluver. Uh, those can be ordered normally as before, uh, but most of the products are online products. So I think from this point of view, uh, the, the, the situation uh, benefited uh, if we can use this word. Uh, we have uh, more readership online, which I think uh, it's, it's a natural thing. As a matter of fact, in April and May, uh, we, we've seen a huge rise in the numbers of readers from different corners of the world. And, uh, and um, that was almost at the end of, uh, let's say, the, the, the quarantine period for most of the countries. Um, but the numbers remain the same high as always. Indeed, there is an increased uh, uh, demand to be published um, on the blog. As you said, people tend to be more creative. I don't know if they have more time, but definitely some of the time that would, was used before for what Alison was mentioning, the, the, the talk next to the copy machine is probably now used to think about an interesting topic and an interesting post to be published. So from this point of view, I think we have more interesting topics. Uh, uh, we also tend to cover uh, from a substantive uh, point of view, the, the webinars and the conferences. We had some of uh, Delos uh, uh, events as well, uh, many other events around the world. Uh, now that uh, for some, they're not at the convenient hour, uh, we see more readership online uh, looking for this kind of uh, 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 publication. So yes, uh, uh, but to add to this, obviously this means uh, much more work on our editors. And I want to thank all, each and all of them uh, for their hard work. Okay, um, so, so maybe to close down on our interesting discussion um, with a final question, which sort of would close down on, 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 on our discussion, which is, adopting more of a forward-looking approach. So maybe to travel uh, forward in time and, and to the future. And, and Alison, how do you sort of see GAR in 10 years, assuming we were to travel 10 years in time? Uh, we, we know now how it started off uh, in 2007. So how do you sort of envisage GAR in about 10 years? Um, I mean, I hope we'll still be in the leadership position we are in now and, um, you know, our quest for world domination with conferences and, <laughs> and everything else will have continued. Um, I think, um, obviously, I, I expect during those 10 years there will be further exponential growth in the use of international arbitration, although obviously it's threatened um, in certain quarters. Um, one thing I do think is very notable at the moment is that although it's a very, though the arbitration community is very disparate and very geographically diverse, um, it's also very tight in the sense that it has very clear kind of figureheads 
and everyone's interested to hear what say Jan Paulson has to say on a topic which makes the kind of content very obvious. I think as it diversifies more and kind of that the kind of triangular structure of arbitration changes, it, it might be more difficult for us to report because there will be so many more localized developments and so many important figures kind of emerging um, that it will be less obvious. At the moment, I sometimes feel we're like a kind of school magazine reporting on what the prefects do and everyone reads it avidly, um, or we're a kind of community notice board. But I think, um, I think that's changing slightly. Um, the other thing I wonder about the future is whether, because of the huge importance of international arbitration and the huge amounts at stake, whether mainstream media is going to catch up and start reporting this more comprehensively and in a more informed way, um, which would obviously be to the detriment of kind of paywall publications um, aimed at the industry specifically. Um, you know, if you can read these kinds of developments in the FT and you know that you're getting the full story. Um, so that's definitely something to think about. Yeah, and Karina, if I could just maybe ha hand it over to you just to close down on how you sort of would, would, would see Clure arbitration blog evolving uh, in the next 10 years. I, I hope uh, we'll have the same discussion in 10 years <laughs> and, and evaluate uh, the past 10 years. I think, uh, I, I hope we'll continue strong and will benefit from continuous support and trust of our readership. And uh, just just by uh, to highlight this, uh, we are a free publication, so anybody can go on the blog and read it. And I, I I don't know what the future will bring, but I hope we can service the arbitration community uh, in the same manner and be accessible to everybody. I do hope that we'll see um, more from the end users. Uh, we encourage um, corporate counsel to contribute to the discussion. We have a very good friend in the person of Mike McElrath from Baker Hughes, who is, a, who is a very active voice on the blog, but we try to encourage more corporate counsel to give their perspective on arbitration. Uh, we also uh, encourage arbitration institutions uh, we have some of them as our permanent contributors, and I think this can only benefit to, to, to the discussion. And uh, uh, we also want to hear from the arbitrators. And we, we, we had an initiative of this kind, and I think uh, probably uh, unique in the arbitration community where the entire arbitral tribunal and the council on both sides, the parties, they wrote a blog post on Clover Arbitration Blog about teaching uh, um, session for arbitral tribunals. So something that we can learn from them and the, the, the arbitration practitioners can hear from the arbitrators on how to advance arbitration um, and trust it. And uh, probably what we all hope to see uh, to encourage diversity, uh, not only regional diversity, but also cultural diversity, gender diversity, uh, education, di educational diversity. We want and we everybody to represent what the arbitration community is. So, um, of course, uh, we want to uh, have the same amazing editors uh, in the next ten years, and uh, that's yeah, nothing big. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks very much to both of you. I can see we have a couple of minutes left and I, I, I can see a question from one of the participants and um, it's a question to both of you, Alison and, and, and Karina. Uh, I'm reading it. What are the prospects that GAR and the Clover Arbitration Blog will extend their coverage from projects and investment disputes to disputes arising from international commerce? trade, I would say, um, ad hoc maritime arbitration, um, LMAA, and administered trade association arbitration such as GAFTA, um, LME, and so, so what are the, um, maybe a brief answer to our participant? 
Well, I can I can say that uh, at least for the blog uh, we co we covered in the past uh, all this mentioned uh, in the question. Um, in fact, uh, when uh, on the occasion of the London uh, uh, Disputes Week, uh, we try to bring a bit more uh, specialized arbitration into the blog, and we try to make this a constant feature of the blog. Uh, but the problem is, and probably something that we need to make uh, a proactive push, uh, is that um, this, this, this specialized arbitration is probably not as present or not as accessible as investment arbitration or commercial arbitration broadly. So I think we also need a bit of help from, uh, uh, from the practitioners in the specific fields but definitely it, it is not excluded from the coverage. Um, as far as GAR is concerned, I mean, we have touched on both those areas in the past. Um, generally, we seem to be looking for ways to limit our coverage rather than to expand it because, you know, the amount, the backlog we have and the amount of people who want coverage is sometimes quite overwhelming. I think it's unlikely that we're going to expand into those areas in a major way, but our publishing house is producing new publications the whole time in different areas. So it's very possible that they would consider a separate specialist publication in those areas. All right, great. Well, well with that, um, um, it was a pleasure speaking with both of you, Alison and Karina, and, um, I leave it that I give it back to you, Toma, for any concluding remarks to this very insightful and informative session. Muting myself. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, Alison. And thank you very much, Krina. It was indeed a very insightful discussion. I very much enjoyed it. Um, and. Um, and uh, I, I wish I, I would like to to thank you uh, to thank you the three of you uh, on behalf of Delos um, and uh, and I hope uh, we will have uh, we will have further sessions uh, as instructive as and insightful as as this one I have no doubt this would be the case um, so thank you thank you very much.